Hi, GCSE sociologists. Um, this lecture is looking at the different types of data that's used in sociological research. Um, this is an introduction to research methods, but also um, a bit of revision for those of you that perhaps have already studied research methods at GCSE level. So let's get started. There are four different types of data in sociology. Um, there is secondary or primary data or quantitative and qualitative data. And you can get these two together. So you can get quantitative primary or secondary data and you can also get qualitative primary or secondary data. What you need to be able to do is define what each of these data types is. So you may need to be able to define secondary, you define qualitative, for example. You need to be able to give examples of the different research methods that will give you each data type and you need to be able to explain their strengths and weaknesses. So let's get started with primary data. Um, primary, hopefully the clue is in the word, it's first hand, um, the researcher themselves is there to collect the data. This is when they ask questions um, to participants or they observe participants directly. So quite often primary data is collected face to face. Now obviously that doesn't count if a researcher has written a questionnaire and they then send it by email or post. Um, so we can also say that primary data collection also does include questionnaires, even if you might not be face to face, but you will have written the questions and you will collect the data from those questionnaires. Um, the findings from their research is based on the responses and observations they might see of their participants in their study. Uh, so the key strengths in primary data collection include uh, that the sociologist knows exactly where the information has come from. Um, arguably, if it's face to face, participants might be less likely to lie if it's face to face. So if you're completing an interview face to face or a questionnaire with someone there, you might not lie or you might think, oh, if I do lie, they're going to spot it, for example. Um, the researcher also knows who's been asked these questions. So the researcher can kind of be a bit more certain that their research has kind of gone to the right people or they've stopped the right people in the streets or they've observed the people, the right people as part of their study. Um, and this is another strength that we'll look at a bit later is um, if you control your own study and you're collecting the data yourself, you can define the concepts clearly. OK, so I've given the example there of poverty. Quite often po the word poverty can mean different things to different people. Um, so if you're doing your own research, you can be sure that you've defined poverty. So you might say, oh, it, it includes anybody who um, earns less than £12,000 a year or anybody who lives in this particular uh, council estate, for example. And there's some example of primary research methods. So you might conduct interviews, questionnaires, observations, um, and also the method of um, content analysis, uh, where you would collect the data from a written document and analyze it. So secondary data is data that already exists. Um, this information has been collected by somebody else or another organisation, possibly for another reason. Um, one of the main sources of secondary data is the government. The government is collects quite a lot of data on a wide range of areas and quite often sociologists make use of that research. I've given you the example there. Um, so school exam results, they're a type of secondary data. Uh, they're published in what's called league tables. So these are collected by schools, which do that for the government. Um, other examples might be um, from the NHS, like health statistics, like the reasons why people are dying and the reasons, the sort of weight, average weight of the population. Those are all statistics collected by government agencies like the NHS, for example. Um, so they are secondary data. They've been collected by the government in this case. Um, another example I've given you here is what's known as a qualitative source. Um, newspaper articles, for example, perhaps on the environment or newspaper articles on, I don't know, schools or newspaper articles on health. These are written documents that have been written by someone else for another reason. But sociologists can make use of those documents to, to conduct research, particularly on things like, you know, public opinions on different matters and, and for example, on how they might have changed and their attitudes towards the environment, for example. So secondary data has plenty of strengths. It's often a starting point in sociological research. Um, it saves time as a researcher doesn't have to collect the data themselves. So that's a really big plus. OK, it's, it, you know, the data is already out there. They don't have to go around and say to every student, hey, what exam results did you get? Because that data has already been collected by the school. 
Um, most of this sort of data is available for free and probably online. So, um, you know, a school, school achievement data is available online. Um, and um, of course, newspaper articles are all available online, for example. Um, and they allow sociologists to examine what's happened in the past and makes it a bit easier for them to spot patterns and trends. Um, so quite often researchers will start off with secondary data um, and they'll look at a pattern. So, for example, school exam results data might say, oh, look, girls seem to be do do doing better than boys. And that seems to happen again and again. Um, I'm going to do some research and find out why that might, might be. So you might start off with secondary data, but then you might decide that you're going to interview students, for example, boys and girls, and try and find out for yourself what's going on. So you might start off with secondary data, but then actually collect your own primary data to kind of come to your own conclusions. What's really useful about secondary data is it's normally collected on quite a big scale, if it's um, statistical data anyway, and it's quite easy then to look at this huge amount of data and identify big patterns, and we can sometimes use these to make predictions about human behaviour. So if we've got, I don't know, 10 years of data saying that boys don't do so well as girls in school, you might say, well, I can predict then next year that boys won't do as well as school perhaps, at school perhaps. And I've given you some examples of secondary research methods there, official statistics, data from opinion polls and census data, which is collected by the government. You can Google census to find out what that is. Use of personal documents and diaries. They're all secondary data because obviously they've been like letters and diaries. They've been written by other people, not for the purpose of your research, but you can still find if you can get access to that quite useful to find out what people's thoughts and feelings are. You've got historical documents there. Um, historical documents does also include newspaper articles, really, because once a newspaper article is written, it becomes part of history. Um, social media postings is a secondary source of data. Uh, you could like look at, you know, your friend's Instagram post or your your friend's Facebook post, perhaps, and you could analyse. Well, how many of them are talking about the environment? How many of them are talking about? issues of sexism, how many of them are expressing particular types of views. And although lots of people think about data as being written or, or statistics, it also does include like videos, films and news reports um, that are visual, for example, as well. So the other types of data are quantitative or qualitative data. So I'm going to start off by talking to you about quantitative data. So quantitative data is data that's numerical. It's, it's information that you can collect and easily convert into numbers or statistics. Um, and the key word there I always think is quantity. OK, it's when you can get your responses and put them into numbered quantities. So if you ever get stuck and think, oh, is it quantitative or qualitative? Look for that word quantity in the word quantitative. And that's all about numbers, the quantity of numbers. So in a questionnaire, if you asked, what is your favourite colour? And if five participants said red, three green and one blue, you then created numerical data from their responses that you can then, as I said in my strengths, spot patterns and trends quite easily. So I can easily see from that research that red is the most popular colour. You know, and if I've collected uh, information on gender as well, I might say, oh, look, red is far more popular for girls than it is for boys. You know, those are the sorts of things that you can look for quite easily. You can make graphs and tables from numerical quantitative data easily like I've given you a couple of examples of on the right. And it's really quick to collect the data so you can get it from more people. So um, asking people questionnaires, sorry, questions uh, through questionnaires, that means you can get maybe loads of questionnaires out to lots of people. You can get their responses in. And because it's so quick to analyse, you're able to ask a lot more people those questions, which makes your study a lot more representative. Weaknesses, however, is quite often um, responses that can be converted into numbers, okay, uh, that can, can be quite limited and they don't really allow participants to fully explain themselves. So you might say to someone, how are you feeling today on a scale of one to five with one being bad and five being good? Um, you're not really allowing people to explain themselves. They might go, oh, I'm feeling a bit three, but they might not say, oh, you know, because this happened to me this morning, but I didn't get much sleep, but I'm actually quite happy that I'm sitting next to my friend on the bus today. It doesn't allow people to explain themselves. It might not give participants the answer option they want. So, you know, in the question about colour, if indigo wasn't there as an option, I might be like, oh, indigo is my favourite colour and it's not there, so I can't tick it. So I might end up ticking, I don't know, blue, even though I don't mean blue. 
And some people argue that it's a bit easier to lie in this type of research because you're just asking and answering short questions with tick box answers, for example, and you don't have to think about your response too much and you don't have to explain yourself. So it might be a bit easier to lie. So that can affect what's called the validity of the study. Qualitative data, on the other hand, is um, data that gathers a lot more information, normally in the written form. So lots of words and sentences or recordings of people talking, for example. Uh, so example, I've given you an example there. It might be long and detailed verbal responses to what we call open interview questions. Um, what I mean by an open question is a question that could have any response. So I might say, instead of saying, how are you today on a scale of one to five, I might go, how are you today? And you might respond, good but hopefully you might go, oh yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I'm, I think I feel like today's gone well, which is a much longer response. Okay, it's more detailed and it allows me to understand why perhaps you f you're feeling good or bad that day because you've explained yourself. That's what an open question is. Uh, another example of qualitative data might be notes on what a researcher sees people do if they're doing what's called an observation study. So if you're sat there watching a group of people doing stuff, which is quite often a, a research approach in sociology, it's known as observation, you might write down interesting things that you see. You might say, oh, you know, such and such people look quite angry today. Uh, these sorts of people um, look like they're really busy and quite stressed because you're observing their behaviour and, and what they're doing. So one of the strengths of qualitative data is arguably that it's got more quality. So again, just trying to help you understand the difference between the two. So if you're like, again, oh, which one's quantitative, qualitative, look out for that word quality. It's almost in the word qualitative. Um, arguably, it's more quality because it's in depth, it's rich and it's detailed because uh, it allows participants to fully explain themselves and answers. So researchers can see the truth or get a better idea of what really is going on because they're giving you a lot more information. However, weaknesses um, is this kind of approach takes a lot longer to collect the data because if you've got to sit down with people and go, oh, how are you today? And they explain themselves uh, in uh, quite a few words. That's going to take longer than people going, oh, I'm feeling three, you know. Um, it's also much more difficult to spot patterns and trends. OK, you have to read through the responses, perhaps, or read, listen to the responses and really figure out how people are feeling. And then you have to figure out, oh, you know, are there, is there a pattern or is there a trend going on here? This, it's not as clear. You can't put it into a graph. Um, and from an ethical point of view, some people might not be comfortable going into detail about some of the things you might want to find out through an open question. Uh, you know, it could be about, you know, if you're talking to people about, you know, how they're getting on in school, uh, people might feel a bit embarrassed um, about how they're getting on. They might not want to talk in detail about why they're not doing well, or they might not want to feel like they're boasting about doing well, for example. So that can make people feel a bit uncomfortable. So I think this is quite a handy activity that I've just uh, stolen off the internet about to, to illustrate the difference between quantitative and qualitative data. Um, so if, say you had to analyse or look at a bookcase, how would you get quantitative data from that? So number data, things like three feet tall, how much it weighs, how many books are on it, how many shelves, um, you know, what colours, how many colours are on there. So that's all number data. Whereas if you're going to qualitatively analyse that bookcase, you might say, oh, it's made of wood. It was built in Italy. Um, the only way you'd know that is if you'd done a bit of more research about this cabinet and asked maybe someone how it came from. You might, in your own opinion, say it's deep brown. OK, someone else might say it's light brown. Uh, you might say it smells like oak and it has a smooth finish. So these are all almost like opinions, if you like, um, or interpretations. So. Just a little activity before we come to the end of this um, lecture. Um, have a look at these research methods and can you have a go at figuring out if they're quantitative or qualitative? So what sort of data are they going to collect? Are they going to create that quantity data, that numerical quantity data? Or are they going to collect qualitative data, like rich quality, lots of detail, written information? And are they primary or are they secondary? OK. So have a read through those one, two, three, four, five different research scenarios and tell me what you think.